Uh, Father God, we are so grateful to gather together. Lord, to worship you. Thank you for the worship team, God. I pray that you would bless them, bless their families, God. Protect them and just be with them. And God, I pray that you would just uh, fill our hearts and our minds as we dig into your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are taking a break from going through the Gospel of Luke, line by line, verse by verse, to really talk about the church. And I think it is so imperative in these days that we have a right understanding of what the church is and how it should be functioning. It is our prayer to be a biblical church at Living Water. Uh, we want to be completely obedient to the word of God. Uh, Randy and I were talking earlier, we are biblicists. What does that mean? The Bible is our sole source of faith and practice. And so we want to be a church that lines up with the word of God. Last week was Pentecost Sunday, and we covered part one of our series. We talked about the baptism and gifting of the Holy Spirit and how imperative it is to have that empowering of the Holy Spirit, especially in these last days. We talked about how on Pentecost, Moses received the Ten Commandments and 3,000 people died. On the real Pentecost, when the birth of the church, the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 people uh, uh, were given life. So I love we compared and contrast all of that. It's so important. The apostate church rejects the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Who knows who that guy is up there? <laughs> He's an old guy, that's for sure. Uh, he said this, I am of the opinion that the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit. And we see that everywhere. In fact, a lot of the churches today and denominations reject the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That is imperative. We have to have that. A religion without the Holy Spirit, that's dead Christianity we talked about last week. Christianity without Christ, we're even seeing that. And in the progressive church, the emergent church, they're like, man, Christ didn't even have to die. That was never God's intention. Can you believe that? Oh, it's horrible. It's, it's terrible. Forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And we're seeing all of this come to pass. This guy started the Salvation Army. <laughs> William Booth, not associated with the guy who shot the president. So today is part two of our study on the church. What are the biblical instructions on how to do church? And we're going to go through that in depth starting next week. But we have to answer a question this week. What is the church? I mean, really, what does it mean to be the church? What does the Bible, how does it define it? So we have to answer that. Webster's defines it like this. A building for public and especially Christian worship. <laughs> It's funny. Uh, man, I witness everywhere I go, Starbucks, the grocery store, wherever I'm at, and uh, inevitably it'll come up, oh, so you're a pastor. Where's your church? And, I mean, uh, the building? <laughs> That's not the church. But they, if I say we meet in a water district, they say, oh, well, you're not a real church then, are you? <laughs> They think it's a building or clergy that uh, govern a religious body or sometimes capitalized a body or organization or uh, um, corporation, some churches, of religious believers. Church is a Germanic word referring to God's house. And I want you to get this. It's not in the Bible. It simply isn't. Everywhere in the Bible, church is used, the word actually means something very different. In fact, the word church isn't in the uh, original manuscripts. Who knows what that is in the Greek? Ekklesia, right? 
the ecclesia. So that really is substituted for the word church. So why did the original translators change the meaning? They totally changed it. 112 times they changed the word ecclesia to church. It's not even a Greek or Hebrew word. It's a Germanic word. <laughs> and it means God's house. It's not a translation or transliteration. It's a totally different word. And it literally means God's house. Okay, so that's not bad. I mean, to define the church as God's house is kind of a good definition, but that's not ecclesia. So we need to find out really what the Bible says. So what happened? John Wycliffe translated the first Bible into English in 1382 from the Latin. And John changed the Latin ecclesium into churche. Okay, borrowing from the Germanic. Uh, from assembly to God's house. Tyndale in 1526 used congregation instead of ecclesia. That's closer and in fact, all translations use congregation except Wycliffe and eventually the Geneva Bible of 1560, and they use the word church as well. And that filtered down to us. However, for everyone in the world today, church means a religious building or organization, and we aren't that. <laughs> it's not even biblical to call it that. What is the most used allegory of church today? I want you to think about it. Church is a hospital, have you ever heard that? Where the sick can come and get healed, okay? Church is an evangelistic opportunity for sinners to come get saved, okay? Is that really what the church is? Pastors for centuries called it a hospital where the sick and wounded come to find healing. We're an evangelistic outreach where sinners get saved, a place where we entertain sinners rather than equip the saints. And folks, that simply is not the church at all. So what is the ecclesia? Today we're going to delve into the depths of our identity as a gathering of believers and explore the profound significance of being more than just a church. We are the ecclesia, literally the called out assembly with a divine purpose. The church, Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, he gave some as apostles. Today, those are those that are sent. Apostle literally means sent ones. So uh, church planters and missionaries are fulfilling the role of apostleship, not with apostolic authority like the 12, uh, but apostles, those who are sent to start churches or to be uh, missionaries on the mission field, like Nani's getting ready to go. <laughs> Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. What's the purpose of church? For the equipping of the saints for works of ministry to build up the body of Christ. That is why we have church. It's not to bring sinners in to get saved. You get them saved out there, then you bring them here to get discipled and equipped. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so what is the church? What did it mean to the first century, the word ecclesia? We have to run the scripture to find out. In Acts 19, Paul was preaching and revival broke out in Ephesus. You guys might remember the story. Uh, in Ephesus, they had a temple to Artemis, and they had all these silversmiths that made little miniature idols that people would buy and take home and put in their houses and worship these little idols and pray to these little idols. But what happened? A revival broke out, and nobody was buying their idols anymore. They were starting to lose money. In fact, they said, Acts 19.26, you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods at all. True. <laughs> not only this, there is danger that the trade of ours will fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of our great goddess Artemis 
would be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will be dethroned from her magnificence. So guess what these guys did? They called an ecclesia. Okay, these are pagans. What's an ecclesia? Well, we'll find out, Acts 19.32. So then some were shouting one thing and some another for the ecclesia was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander since the Jews had put him forward and having motion with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the ecclesia the assembly. Okay, back in this time, in, in the greco Roman Roman world, the ecclesia was used as a gathering of free citizens that had authority to make decisions. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Ecclesia, Thayer's definition, a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place, an assembly an assembly of the people convened at a public place of the council for the purpose of deliberating political and social issues. Okay, that is what, when uh, New Testament times, when they used the word ecclesia, this is what they compared it to. What did ecclesia mean back then? Well, 507 BC, the Athenian leader, Cleonysius, introduced a system of political reforms that he called democratia, or rule by the people. From demos, the people, and kratos, power. It was the first democracy in the world. Okay, 507. This was in Athens. The Athenian democracy was a direct democracy made up of three important institutions. The first was the ecclesia, or assembly, the sovereign governing body of all of Athens. Then there was the bully, the Council of 500, and the dicasteria, the courts. Okay, the bully was 500 citizen councils selected randomly to decide which issues should be brought to the assembly. The assembly is the ecclesia, the governing body. Okay, back then. 50 citizens from the council were chosen to handle the daily issues of running the city state. The dicasteria were the courts where hundreds of citizens served and juries to make sure they could not be bought off and they were chosen by lottery. But the ecclesia, the assembly, was all the free men, 18 and over, in the whole realm of Athens. And they all took part in the ecclesia or assembly. Uh, they met 40 times a year and the ecclesia met on a central hill in Athens called the Penix. Yeah, it's a funny name. The power of the ecclesia. At the meetings, the ecclesia made decisions about war, foreign policy. They wrote and revised laws and approved or condemned the conduct of public officials. Ecclesia would be compared today to our Senate or House of Representatives. Okay, in their mind. They could also ostracize a citizen and expel them from Athens for 10 years. Uh, if someone was pretty crazy. By the way, they didn't have police back there. The citizens themselves were, <laughs> were the, uh, the police and all of that. Ecclesia was a powerful assembly of the called out ones. In ancient Greece and Rome, some other Hellenistic cities, the Ecclesia referred to the assembly of citizens who gathered to discuss and make decisions on matters of public importance. It was a democratic institution where citizens had the opportunity to voice their opinions and vote on various issues. And the church is an ecclesia. Now, it, it's curious to me that Jesus named the church. Okay, we'll read the verse in a minute, but this is what Jesus chose to call the church. Why not a synagogue of Christians? <laughs> because the Jewish gatherings were called synagogues. But he chose a secular term that referred to a governing body of free citizens. I want you to consider that. It literally means citizens called to a governing assembly. As believers, our true citizenship is in heaven. Amen? 
Okay, so just as the ecclesia was a gathering of citizens with authority, the church is a gathering of heavenly citizens with authority. Jesus called us the ecclesia, and uh, oh, skip that. Uh, had he not done that, most likely we'd be called the synagogue of Jesus <laughs> you know, or Christ's followers, the assembly of free men and women in his kingdom. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of the world, then the servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify of the truth. The idea of being citizens of heaven, as mentioned over and over in Scripture, implies that we are members of the heavenly kingdom. We're seen as belonging to a spiritual citizenship that transcends earthly boundaries. In this sense, the concept of ecclesia can be understood as a assembly of the citizens of heaven coming together as a community to worship God, be equipped to minister to each other, and share the gospel with the citizens of this world. Are you with me? Okay. So, ecclesia of the living God, 1 Timothy 3.15, but in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the ecclesia of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And we need to get back to supporting the truth. Amen? Because so many Christians and denominations are compromised. God's house is the ecclesia, but the ecclesia is the assembly of free men and women who are royal priests and ambassadors, citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And all of us are part of that assembly, that ecclesia. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So church then is an assembly of called out ones who have authority by a sovereign kingdom. And the kingdom is God's kingdom. I love this in 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Paul said, or do you not know that the saints, the church, all of us who are Christ followers will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account to the ecclesia? the gathering of free people. Jesus gave us the name. He actually gave it to us in Matthew 16, 18, the first time it was used. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock my ecclesia will be built, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What is Christ doing right here? He is saying that our citizenship is in heaven, and God is giving us authority as the assembly of called out ones, free men and women in Christ, to make decisions, to bind things that will be bound in heaven and to loose things that will be loosed in heaven and the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Essentially, we are given authority. Make no mistake about it. Jesus had in mind when he called us, the church, the ecclesia, the the Roman and Greco-Roman assembly of free men who made all the decisions and reigned. And he's in context, giving us that authority. The assembly of believers, God's house, is an assembly or senate of ambassadors. John 17, 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And we live in enemy territory. We're called ambassadors of God's kingdom. So our gathering places, as those living in a foreign land, should be called embassies. (laughs) Are you with me? Okay. 
So our churches need to become embassies where ambassadors find refuge, refueling, and refreshment that are equipped, that are armored up to go out into enemy territory and be ambassadors of light, putting on the armor of light to a lost and hurting world. True sanctuaries where citizens of heaven can assemble and be equipped, empowered, and encouraged in the faith. Amen? Please note this. The church is not the kingdom of God on earth. We're not building God's kingdom on this planet. The church is an embassy of the kingdom of God in foreign territory. Now, one day, Christ will be the ruler of this world at the blowing of the seventh trumpet. In the book of Revelation, it says, now the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God, and he will reign he will, at the second coming, reign on this planet for a thousand years. We'll reign with him. But Jesus was calling the church almost a political organization, the ecclesia. Ambassadors of a heavenly kingdom. The church is an embassy in enemy territory where ambassadors, us, are safe, where people can taste a little bit of heaven on earth. Amen. The local Christian churches or assemblies serve as embassies of God's kingdom within the earthly realm. And just as embassies represent the interest and values of a particular country in a foreign land, churches, the ecclesia, are seen as representing the values, teaching, and mission of God's kingdom to a lost and hurting world. We are the ecclesia. It emphasizes the idea that we're not merely a social or religious group. Weren't we talking about that, Randy? <laughs> yeah, we're not religious. We're, 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 well, and yeah, the true, the definition of religion is a, a, a system in uh, getting to know God, right? But we have a relationship. We're above that. Creeds and rules and traditions made by men mean nothing to us. The Bible is our constitution. <laughs> Christ is the head of the ecclesia. And we are all ambassadors and ministers and royal priests with authority given by God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It conveys the idea of a community of believers. That's why we're called the body of Christ. And we're going to talk about that as we get into instructions on how to do church in the next few weeks. But we're all members of the body of Christ. We're all important. Believe me, if you ever broke your toe, you know how vital your toe is <laughs> to your whole body. Yeah, it's hard to walk with a broken toe. It hurts. And poor Mike, if you broke that, you know how important that <laughs> is to your whole body. We're all important. There is not one person at living water that is better than another. Not one. We're all completely equal. We're all free men and women in Christ. We're not just the church. We're the ecclesia. The profound significance of us being called the ecclesia lies in the recognition of the church as a called out assembly of free men and women with a divine purpose. A community united in faith and fellowship and actively engaged in God's mission everywhere we go. In fact, this is the most important institution besides the family, is the church. The only other institution established by God. Oh, that clock went off, Randy. I went up there to look and it's just, it is off. Yeah, we got time. Okay. As the ecclesia, we are not defined by a building, traditions, or rituals, or anything else. Our identity lies in our relationship with Jesus Christ and one another. We are the body of Christ, the living representation of his love, grace, and truth to a lost and hurting world. The ecclesia is not a passive entity, but an active agent of change. And the church has failed, America especially, 
because we used to be a nation built on Judeo-Christian ethics. And the church, what did it do? Lost its saltiness. It said, let's try to look as much like the world as we can so the world will like us. Man, it's so interesting to me that Jesus said, you're going to be hated by the world. Stop trying to get the world to like you. Man, let's be salt and light. Let's shine forth the glory and love of God to a lost and hurting world and teach the word of God faithfully. We're entrusted with the proclamation of the gospel. We are to embody the very presence of Christ in our interactions to the world. The power of the ecclesia does not lie in human strength or worldly influence, but in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit within us. We need that desperately. It is the thing lacking in most churches today. We gather and are empowered by the Spirit, and we become a force that challenges darkness, that breaks chains, and transforms lives. Amen? That's what we're about. It's not just to gather and feel good Sunday morning and then forget about it the rest of the week, but it's to live as ambassadors in a foreign country. Those of you that have been on the mission field, you know all day you are praying. All day you are seeking the Lord because I am an ambassador of Christ in a foreign land. Well, folks, you're an ambassador of Christ in America. It's a foreign land. We're ambassadors here. The church is an embassy where we come and get equipped to go out and shine forth the light. When we leave these doors, we used to have a sign, you're entering the mission field <laughs> you know, when you walk out. It is through the ecclesia that God's kingdom is revealed. His purposes are accomplished. Worship team, come on up. The concept of the ecclesia being an embassy of heaven's kingdom on earth highlights the role of the church as a representative and outpost of God's kingdom in this realm. It signifies that we as believers are called out ones to be ambassadors, carrying the values, the teachings, and the mission of God's kingdom into a lost and hurting world. The church as an embassy of God's kingdom reflects the authority, purpose, character of our heavenly realm and brings about transformation, proclaiming the gospel, equipping the saints, embodying the love and grace of God in all of its interactions. We are the ecclesia, not just the church. Amen? Our gathering's not merely a routine, but a divine appointment to fulfill our identity and mission. And folks, uh, I, I so desire for this church to fully be a biblical church. Amen? And, I mean, we have traditions, but what does the Bible say? And so in the next few weeks, we're going to get clear instruction on how we should act and behave and what we should be doing when we gather in this embassy of God's kingdom at the water district to be equipped and encouraged and empowered by the Spirit. So let us embrace the truth and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, living out our calling as ambassadors of God's kingdom. May our lives individually and collectively radiate the love, the grace, and the truth of our heavenly King. Amen. God bless you. Uh, let's stand as we sing this last song. Father God, I pray that you would instill within our hearts, God, the great privilege it is to not just be your house, your building, but God, to be the ecclesia, representing your kingdom to a lost and hurting world. God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that living water, Lord, would be a, a city on a hill, a light that shines bright in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. God, I pray that you would fill us and empower us with your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and direction. And Lord, help us be pleasing to you in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Brad. Powerful, powerful message. Please join us for our closing song, which is fast becoming the anthem, I think, of...